Welcome back. And we're moving into our first conversation this morning as we're joined by attorney at law, Michelle Shabbat, uh, talking about a recent case of malpractice that has went through the courts. Good morning Good and morning. welcome. Good morning. This is a topic I think people don't like to think about. Um, you know, when you are ill and you go to a health facility, people expect the best care possible. Um, and when things don't go right, uh, very often people make assumptions that something is wrong and sometimes it is the case and sometimes it isn't. Let's just talk about what the definition of malpractice is in the first place. Right. Um, malpractice or medical negligence as we call it is based on the law of negligence pretty much, right? Um, and what the law says is that uh, there must be a duty of care mm -hmm. and you know when you go to a doctor, doctors swear an oath to save your life and so there's a duty, there, you must establish that there's first a duty of care mm -hmm. and there's been a breach of that care and as a result of that breach, you have suffered a loss which is recognizable by law. Mm -hmm. So it sounds complicated, but it's not as complicated. It just means there was a wrong decision. It means there was a wrong act or omission. Okay. Yes, pretty much. And how do you determine, how do you differentiate between uh, what, what is a, just an error. I mean, in every profession, there must be a margin right. for error, and particularly when you're saving lives. Absolutely. Um, in, in medical negligence cases, what the court looks at is there is an established practice, um, an established standard that is required of doctors. And so it is not every act or every omission that will qualify as negligence, right? It is whether or not you fall below the standard that is accepted and that is expected of a doctor. Now, it's interesting because we don't see as many cases as we would think right. um, in the courts uh, uh, when it comes to malpractice. Yeah. Talk to us about uh, when your client first approached you and, and uh, whether or not it took some convincing to be able to consider going through the courts. Actually, about the most recent case that I did, yeah. um, my client was convinced that she was done a wrong. Okay. Um, I had to step back and I had to look at it more holistically. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing we did was to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. We actually got a doctor to look at her entire medical history and to see what was done to her and to give us a preliminary opinion mm -hmm. as to whether or not what was done to her amounted to negligence in that doctor's opinion. Mm -hmm. Once I secured that opinion, then we started moving forward with the case. Mm. Yeah. And looking at the specific situation yes. uh, uh, of this particular case, um, explain to us the errors that were made in the process. Right. Well, um, this was a particularly bad one. And just, just, for, just for me to lay a little bit of the background as, what went, as to what went into this case so you can understand yeah. it. Um, once we actually filed the papers, the documents in court, what happened was that both sides, the claimant side and the defendant side, agreed on an expert witness so what that was is we selected a gynecologist um, to give us an opinion, to give the court an opinion, to assist the court in arriving at a conclusion as to what, in the final analysis, Marlene, it is for the court to decide whether or not there was negligence or not. Mm -hmm. So we had this expert come in and she gave an opinion as to what transpired. She was given all the documents. And in this particular case, it was the expert's opinion that there was negligence from the inception, from the diagnosis up to the surgery and the removal of the womb and the ovary. So it wasn't a consequence of just having the exploratory surgery done and the removal of the womb? No. It, it was, was a, the diagnosis from the start? It was a di misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis from the inception. Wow. Yes. The medical, the medical uh, fraternity is a close-knit society, uh, pretty much like lawyers. Yes. Um, how, difficult it, how difficult was it to get a doctor to testify against another doctor to say, you kind of messed up? It was challenging. It was challenging. But in this case, I think we were fortunate that we had at least two brave doctors who were willing to step up. I think when they saw the magnitude of what had happened to this young lady, I think they were convinced that they needed to step up and speak up. Mm -hmm. And I think that was what made the case for us. You know, it is impossible to get a positive result if doctors aren't willing to speak yeah. not only about the other doctor but about the standard of care yeah. 
that is required of them. Yeah. And I think that's a valid point. I think uh, you, you, you perhaps entered into the situation with your own analysis from your own uh, investigation, but it was still left to, the, to an individual yes. um, to be able to be honest about yes. what the process should have been. Exactly. Now, exactly. the fear of misdiagnosis, I think, is one that all of us have. You know, there, there, well, <laughs> no, there are two types of people. There are people who go into a healthcare facility and want to be told something is wrong whether something is wrong or not. And then there's some of us who go in, and no matter what they tell us, we're still a bit unsure. Right. Um, from your experience in malpractice cases, when we have that uncertainty, and perhaps a major surgery is being recommended, what, what would be your advice to people? Certainly, um, two things. I think when you're confronted with any major surgery, my opinion, my suggestion is you get a second opinion yeah. to validate the first. Um, I think that is important. In this case, this was supposed to be a simple surgery. Um, my client went, had some abdominal pain and she was admitted for what is called a laparotomy, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be an exploratory surgery. Gave no consent for the removal of nothing. And when she awoke, she was left without a womb and an ovary. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yes, definitely when you're faced with any type of surgery, you should always get a second opinion. That's the first thing. And secondly, after you've been through a surgery or a treatment and you feel somehow that something is not right or that you have been injured in some way, follow the instinct, trust your instinct, believe in yourself. You know, since this case, I have had several people call me and ask to speak with me because they say, I had no idea there was a remedy for this. Mm -hmm. I had no idea I could do something about this. And so it's important if you're injured, if you feel affected, that you speak up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of looking at the entire case, yeah. it, it seems as though this was something that was pretty obvious to anybody who is in the medical profession that, he, he, again, you messed up. I'm curious to know why it was that the, the hospital it was? It was the hospital. The government hospital? Yeah. Yes, Western Regional. Yeah. Um, why it is that they did not settle out of court? Why did they pursue it to the end? Um, I think it is a natural reaction. I think it is difficult for people to accept, listen, we did something wrong. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for people to say, listen, I did something wrong and I need to fix it. I'll tell you this, when, my client, when this client first came to me, she said, Mr. Shabbat, all I wanted was for this doctor to say, I am sorry. That's all. If he had said that, we would not be here. And so I think there is some hesitation on the part of the authorities, of the medical practitioner, to accept that they're humans and they could have or may have committed an error. And that led us to where we are today, actually. And this is pretty much the same, uh, if it's the Bermudpan Hospital. It is Western Regional. Yeah. This was the same hospital that the case with the uh, young baby with the cerebral palsy, I think, right. the one mm -hmm. point something million dollar case. Yes, mm -hmm. that is the case that reached the Caribbean Court of Justice, Justice. actually. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen really not pretty much any improvement in that hospital. Kevin, um, you know the history of that hospital. I think the history of that hospital is, is so well known and, and yeah. out in the public. Um, that it, it is a shame. It is a shame. I mean, it calls for immediate attention. Yeah. It calls for immediate attention. Because in, in this case, it's a, almost a double slap. Not only do we have a young lady mm -hmm. who has lost the possibility of having one of the most beautiful things happen to her in her life, is to have a child. Definitely. But this is an ongoing story where that money actually comes from taxpayers' dollars. So the yes. same money that should be fixing the hospital. Yeah. yeah. That's a quarter of a million dollars yeah. is going back in. Yeah, and, and I, think, um, I think, Kevin, the point should not only be in terms of infrastructure and facility, but I think it should also be in ongoing training of the medical practitioners mm -hmm. who are providing services. Yeah. I mean, you come out of medical school after seven or nine years, and you know, even us as attorneys, every day you learn something new, and every day it is important to have refreshers, to have new training seminars, to make sure you're... you're up to par mm -hmm. with the required standard. 
Well, they do, they do have requirements for continued medical yeah. education. Um, and I think that, that uh, there are some institutions that work to be able to in institute it. Yeah. The, the issue that you're bringing up, though, I think is absolutely critical. <clears throat> it means who oversees yeah. or what is the quality assurance that mm -hmm. all decisions that are made or uh, perhaps course of, of treatment that are decided upon yeah. to ensure that it is the best possible option yeah. for the patient themselves. Is there a system like that in place in your investigation? You know, um, in this particular case, I was actually able to get what is called a peer review, mm -hmm. where this case was referred internally to another gynecologist who offers an opinion. Um, and even though the defendants did not disclose that, mm -hmm. even that gynecologist who reviewed what was done said what was done was negligence. Mm. And so this was, a, this was really one of those bad cases, yeah. you know, that internally they knew, internally they knew. When we, they fought all the way mm -hmm. up until when the expert gave her opinion, it was a female who gave yeah. the opinion, and when they saw the report, to their credit, they decided, you know what, we're going to accept liability. Yeah. You know, so. And what was their argument? Their argument was that the doctor had done, had taken the steps necessary to save my client's life, mm -hmm. which was absolutely not so. She was not, her life was not threatened in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and so their, their defense really had no, was not sustainable, mm -hmm. as we'd say, you know. So people can understand, and I'm sure you probably learned, that's, that's a great thing about your jobs, you get to learn so much more about different professions as well. The purpose of an exploratory surgery is because you cannot define the cause for the pain that you're feeling. Right. So in other words, you go in and check. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Right. So in this case, in this case, um, the doctor should have closed up back my client mm -hmm. um, and given her treatment, mm -hmm. right, because she had cysts on her ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, it was not for it to be removed. It was not for the ovaries or the womb to be removed. Yeah. Right, and it's a you can get treatment for it through medication and so forth, mm -hmm. um, and so there was no necessity um, in this case to actually remove her womb or her ovaries. You know, are, were there, are there any repercussions for the doctor himself? Um, I am uncertain as to what the medical board or medical association will do. I think it is a matter for them. They, as far as I understand it, they are the disciplinary body for doctors. Mm -hmm. And so whether they're going to take any action in this case, um, I am I'm unable to say. Mm -hmm. I'm unable to say. But I'll tell you this. Um, he is not the only one. He's not the only one. And if, if those are the top, at the top, who have been um, also found to be negligent, if nothing is done against them, yeah. then it's difficult for you to try and discipline somebody who's under you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doctors have a difficult task extremely difficult task. I, I do not envy them. I don't think yeah. um, next to preschool children, I think doctors are definitely have the most difficult job uh, in the world. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm curious about as well is the issue of how do you calculate? I lost a womb. I, I right. never <laughs> see the smile yeah. of, of my daughter. Yeah. I mean, how do you calculate that loss? Yeah, how it did is, it come to a half a million, a quarter million? Yeah. Um, you, you will know, Kevin, that in all negligence cases in our jurisdiction, in Commonwealth jurisdictions, what we do is we find cases that have dealt with similar injuries. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in Belize, we could find no comparable case where an individual had lost a womb and a set of ovaries or, or, or her ovary. And so what we did in this case, we looked to the wider Caribbean initially to find cases with similar injuries and to find comparable awards. Um, most of the cases we found in the Caribbean were either 15, 10 to 15 years old. Mm. And so in our particular case, I think the judge correctly held that those numbers were not adequate to use in this case. And so in addition to those, what we did was we used the UK guidelines on injuries. Mm -hmm. um, and the judge accepted the UK figures and gave a discount to account for the difference 
in the standard between the UK and here. I think there was a 25% discount on the award. But this is, this is definitely the first case in Belize that deals with a, um, a hysterectomy, hysterectomy mm -hmm. and an ophorectomy. This mm -hmm. is the first. Did no, I, w and I, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Um, so it is based on the value of what the womb and the ovary would have contributed to her life? Not really. It's, it, it's, a, diff it's a difficult yeah. calculation. And it's not an yeah. exact science. Yeah. It's not an exact science. What the law says is that you must try as best as possible to put the person in the position he or she would have been had the injury not occurred. Mm -hmm. And so the court looks at the, the situation holistically yeah. and tries as best as it can to give an amount that would help to make not, obviously you can't put back the person, you can't give her back her womb or her ovary in this case, but what the court tries to do is to give an award to try and have the person live as best a life, a normal life as possible. Mm. Yeah. Now, I imagine that following this ruling, and, and you've already stated several persons have contacted you and said, I didn't know there was something I could do about a decision that yes. was made in my treatment. Yes. Now, it is very important to understand that in the loss of a life or loss of a function in the body, there's a grieving process to go through. Yes. And actually, one of the first things that will happen is that you want to place blame. Yes. Um, how do you help to distinguish with people who come in what is, in fact, most likely negligence, or perhaps they need more time to accept what they have been left with? Right. Um, just based on this case, and again, this is the experience I'm drawing from, what we did in this case is that we had our client actually visit with a psychologist. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was able to get assistance in dealing with the fact of the loss, which is a dramatic yeah. loss, especially for a young lady who's 20 years old, mm -hmm. never had a child, desired to have a family. It's a major loss yeah. and it's an irreparable loss. Um, in her case, she was even diagnosed with um, um, post-traumatic stress mm. um, as a consequence of her loss. Um, and she's fortunate that she had the assistance and has the assistance of a psychologist to help her work through the emotional issues that she's experiencing as a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, but it goes beyond the emotional. It also goes to the physical, the in disruption of the entire system. When one loses um, her, her womb and her ovary at such an early stage, mm -hmm. it means that she's going to be going through Menopause, menopause at a much earlier age. It's a major hormonal yes, shift in your body. major yeah. hormonal shift. So something that you would start experiencing perhaps at 50, you're now experiencing at 21 or 22. Wow. And so you can understand the magnitude of the damage mm -hmm. that has been done to her. Yeah. You know. and, and in helping new clients to go through that distinction? It certainly would be the same. Um, yeah. there, is, there is a fine line. And unfortunately, as attorneys, we sometimes try to be, um, I say, doctor, liar, and priest. Um, but I think it is important to understand that um, people who have suffered these traumatic types of injuries need yeah. professional help. Yeah. And so we always recommend counseling by a professional. That's good. Speaking of being a priest, you know, yes. it, there's obviously cost involved. This case surely was not a free case. No. Um, how does a person who, because these are public hospitals, so it means that these are the persons who cannot afford the private hospitals. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, when, if I am wrong, in terms of, I feel like you said, I had a good feeling that, you know, the doctor left the gauze in me, that's, that's just not right. Yeah. Um, what am I looking at in terms of cost to, be, because all these tests that you have to do before have their yeah. individual cost. If yes. I go to the doctor to get a second opinion, it costs me again, yes. trips up and down. Yeah. Um, what would you say about the, is the cost prohibitive to even before you go to trial? Lawyer fees, mm. other tests? Yeah. Um, what we do, at least in my practice in personal injuries cases and negligence cases, is that we understand, we understand that sometimes 
um, it may be prohibitive to pay legal fees. So what we do, it, we, do, we do it on a contingency basis. And so we ask for just the minimal amount of money down to be able to um, file documents in court once we're convinced there is a case. And so um, we don't get paid unless we're, we actually win the case. Mm -hmm. No right? win, no pay. No win, no pay. Um, the flip side of that, though, is that if you're not successful as a claimant, you have to pay the cost of the other side. Um, and as you know, that can be prohibitive. Yeah. So it's not only weighing you, your personal cost in initiating and sustaining the claim, but it is also confronting the possibility that your claim may not be successful and then the exposure yeah. to having to pay costs to the other side. Yeah. You know, one of the things about these cases um, is that it must have a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, in America, um, where there is insurance premiums, yeah. um, which is, to me, a side effect of litigation. Every time a doctor cuts you, he's thinking, I'm not going yeah. to be able to afford yeah. if yeah. anything goes wrong. And they also get malpractice insurance, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I'm not sure that we have that in Belize, you know. I have never heard of anybody. Well, we have to investigate. But yeah. as, as this case points out, if yeah. you're working in a public facility, the liability is on the institution that hires you and not the actual professional in right. the job. Right. So it means that the institution has to have its own process in place to ensure that nobody is making them liable in the first place. Well, yeah, in, in one sense, but I mean, even if you work in an institution, it is still your act. Yeah. And, and you, as well as the institution, are liable yeah. at the end of the day. But certainly, I think one of the arguments against medical malpractice suits is really that, that the triple effect could be an increase in cost, cost yeah. in medical attention. Yes. Um, well, and, and I wanted to go to another end because I think, you know, you clearly pointed out, we all rely on doctors. And when we are on, uh, in a very critical situation, you know, remembering malpractices is one thing, but we just want to live. And they will do the best that they can to do yes. that. So we have also heard very real challenges within public institutions where doctors and nurses and other professionals just make do with the best that they ca with, with the best that they have um, because of unavailability of resources, lack of human resources. They, I might be seeing twelve patients when realistically my time only allows for eight. Yeah. Um, we can also see how something like this can impact the willingness of a doctor to go the extra mile. Um, did you also identify that perhaps there were? structural issues within the institution. Maybe the doctor had a number of patients that had to be seen. Uh, issues like that. Did you find those? Not in this particular case. Okay. Not in this particular case. But you know, Marlene, those are the hazards of the profession. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you have to do the best you can yeah. in the circumstances in which you find yourself. Yeah. And your best has to be meeting at least a minimum standard. Yeah. You put yourself out there, mm -hmm. in this case as a gynecologist, then you're expected to act within a reasonable uh, manner mm -hmm. that is expected of a gynecologist. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, we don't live in a society where everything is 100%, mm -hmm. and we don't have facilities where everything is 100%. But at the end of the day, if you have done everything possible and everything that is required of you, yeah. then the probabilities of being sued becomes less, right? There was, some very, there was a point that you brought up earlier that I thought was very important as well. You said that the case of the patient went for peer review. In other words, a doctor consulted with another physician, another specialist in his area, to say, do you think this is necessary? No, it was after the fact. Oh, it was after. It was okay. after the fact. It was after. So they knew. Yeah. They knew something was wrong. They knew something had gone wrong, and they took it upon themselves to get a peer review, mm -hmm. right, after the fact. Was she contacted by the hospital at all after the surgery? Um, she did go in uh -huh. because she wanted an explanation mm -hmm. as to why this was done to her, mm -hmm. um, and that ended really badly. Mm. Yeah. So. so it added more injury it and added more, more impetus yes. to take it through the course. Yes. 
court. Yes. There's an article um, in a newspaper that said that the doctor had actually threatened her to sue him. <laughs> well, um, I believe he did. I believe he said that he would sue her that for she, defamation. He would sue her? Yeah, for defamation. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So it did yeah. get pretty nasty. It did, it did get pretty nasty. And again, it is unfortunate. Like I said, when this young lady came to me, she said, all I wanted was for this doctor to say, listen, I am sorry. Yeah. That's all I wanted. Yeah. That is all. She couldn't even get, I'm a, I am sorry. Yeah. Wow. And so that was how bad this case was. And did that factor into the award of the court? The court said, no. he didn't apologize. So no, rem no, rem no, remember that um, they accepted liability at an earlier stage. And so all the court was left to decide on yeah, was okay. the quantum of damages to award her. You know? What do you, what have you learned through this particular case that you think will be helpful for others seeking medical attention yeah. to take into consideration? Yeah, I think a um, couple things. Mm -hmm. The first thing is that not every injury amounts to malpractice, right? Not every injury is medical negligence. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first lesson. The second lesson is if you feel you're injured, if you feel something has been done to you, you need to speak up. You need to ensure that you have it ventilated and investigated properly. Don't stay quiet, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think the third is more of a, a warning. When you're out there and you put yourself out there as having special skills, mm -hmm. you have to ensure that in fact you have those skills. Um, when you take people's lives into your hands, if you don't know, say you don't know. If you need help, get a second opinion before you take certain steps. Yeah. You know, um, do you feel that in Belize it's very hard to get information? I mean, we've seen it everywhere just to get simple documents. Yeah. And Surely there must be some benefit from being able to feel as though if I don't do this right, I'm going to be sued. Yeah. Are there any things that you discovered um, within the actually collecting of information mm -hmm. to prepare for your case that you said, man, this should be so. These documents should really be here quickly so yeah. that somebody who is, can't afford um, an attorney could actually look at it themselves and put everything together, bring it to the attorney, somebody from Cricket Sarko. Right. Right. Did you find anything like that? Well, unfortunately, information is not forthcoming, right? Um, at the initial stages, it was difficult to get the medical history, mm -hmm. um, the, the notes that were taken in the surgery. It was difficult to obtain. But as you know, in the new court system that we have, um, we now are required to give disclosure of documents. And so um, when we got to that stage, they had to reveal all the documents they had at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, at the initial stage, they give you the runaround, they block you every step of the way, and they try to prevent having to give out the information. Okay. But once the case is started, it's, it becomes a different story. Mm -hmm. How difficult is this process for the client? Extremely difficult, yeah. because you're asking the client um, to submit herself to further review, further examination, mm -hmm. to go through a series of tests, um, to submit herself to psychological evaluation. You ask the client to relive the injury and the moments. Mm -hmm. And so it is difficult. It is not easy. Mm -hmm. It is not easy. And um, clients react differently mm -hmm. depending on their circumstance. Yeah. But it is always difficult. Yeah. So that's something people should take into consideration as well. Yes. Um, what they will have to give of yes. themselves. Now, ideally, this is just this is not an attack on on doctors or the healthcare system. It is simply ensuring that people are doing what they are supposed to do yes. um, <laughs> at, at a minimum standard that will ensure uh, proper treatment. What from what you have heard in terms of the case brought, uh, the defense that they put up, what justified, and, and you said they claim that they explore, in the exploratory surgery, the womb and the ovary needed to be removed because her life was threatened. Right. Yeah. How 
were, were you able or how was she able to identify that nothing, I mean, when you're under general anesthesia and somebody is inside your abdomen, I, I don't know if there's some massive bleeding or, right. so obviously she did some research on her, how did she know there was no life-threatening situation on the surgery table to be able to know that the case was wrong? Well, she did not know that there was yeah. no life-threatening situation. Okay. She knew, she knew instinctively that there was no reason mm -hmm. to remove her ovary and her womb. Mm -hmm. That's an instinct. She did not know if in fact there was a life-threatening situation. But it was borne out by the medical reports. She was actually given her womb and her ovary after the surgery, and she, sent, she went to a second doctor to get, and they had a specimen done and sent for testing. And the test results showed that they were perfectly healthy. And so you, you can't come to court and say, listen, my defense is that when I opened you up, I felt that your life was threatened, and so I had to remove your womb and your ovary when in fact, the medical evidence is suggesting completely otherwise. So wow. you, you don't, you, at the time, you don't know. Yeah. You don't know, and that is why I said it requires okay. further examination and investigation. Yeah. You know, but it's her instinct. She knew instinctively that, hey, there is no reason for this. You know? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's... Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. we should not take so long <laughs> to process it, but it's just... Yeah, it's and, and you know what? You know, the, the She's judge. a great advocate, though, and, 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 and I think that has to be identified. A lot of us have things done to us, and we sit back, and we know it, and we do nothing. Yeah. But she took the steps, and she that's took the very step. She is very brave. Yeah. She is very brave, and I'll tell you what. Not only is she brave in trying to have herself not only vindicated, but um, compensated for the wrong that was yeah. done to her, She's brave to stand up for other women to whom mm -hmm. this has happened to. And I'll tell you, she has been subjected to, to slurs and to mm -hmm. comments and mm -hmm. beyond, beyond what is necessary. You know, so she is brave. She is brave. I mean, the comments, those sort of comments beyond the medical. Beyond the medical, you know. I mean, people oh. know, people knew what happened to her and they made comments about her and, you know, totally wrong. Yeah. But she, she stood up. She's a very brave young lady, and, and I mean, credits to her. Yeah. Police officer, sorry. She's a police officer. Mm. She's a police officer. Well, at 20 years old, I think she's definitely a brave woman to, to follow up through the process. And that is something that we can learn from as well. Yes, yes. Even if the investigation leads to, say, leads to the fact that it was necessary, if you feel something, you follow through you with it. You follow through with it. Yeah, she's brave enough. She stood up not only to the doctor, but to the government, mm -hmm. um, who is the doctor's employer. And hers. You know? So, yeah. so she's very brave. Mm -hmm. Very brave, stood alone, did not, did not think twice because she knew yeah. she was wronged. Yeah. One, of the, one of the interesting things, um, is, is there a time frame that if I go to KHMH yeah. and you know, I'm watching this on television right now and I say, listen, I need to get one of those attorneys. Mm -hmm because uh, scissors was left in me. Yeah. Um, but it happened about two years ago. Yeah. Do I still have? Yeah, I believe the statute of limitation is six years. It falls on a personal six injuries. Years. Yeah. Even six in, years. Even in relation to? Uh, Me medical negligence. Even in terms of against the government hospital? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. you have six, six years. years. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, what about the people who are watching and saying, you know, you're just going after doctors, uh, you're going <laughs> after people who are trying to yeah. save lives. Yeah. What do you say? Um, I say doctors, like all professionals, we put ourselves out there as possessing certain skills. We have certain obligations to the community, to the people we serve. Mm -hmm. And we're human beings. We're not infallible. And if we do wrong, then there has to be in place a system to correct that wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a persecution of any profession. Yeah. This is a, a young lady who was wronged and who deserves some justice. Okay. All right. Anything else you'd like to share that you think the public needs to understand? Um, again, I think my last thought on this and last idea, sentiment I'd like to share is to what I said earlier, if you feel you've been wronged, speak up. Mm -hmm. Speak up. There's always somebody out there who's going to be willing to help you. Don't let money a, be a barrier for mm -hmm. you to pursue 
um, getting some justice or some remedy for yourself. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and having this discussion with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to the representatives of the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism. That's coming up after the break. <laughs>